So now we're going to kick off with our first session on insights and inspirations. So as our first change maker, I am absolutely thrilled to have Franz Johansson, the CEO of the Medici Group, join us. I first met Franz at the Great Place to Work conference when he spoke a number of years ago. And I have to admit, I was completely blown away by his insights. And as my wife and our family will tell you, I am rarely blown away by anyone. Uh, Franz joins us from the Medici Group officers in New York City. Welcome, my friend. How are you? Thank you, Greg. I am. Uh, I'm excited. This is great. We've been talking about this for some time. I'm here in in New York. This is not a virtual screen. This is actually what it looks like in our office, although it's empty here. So excited. And it's wonderful to see a person in an office. While I love my home, I, I'm I'm also excited to be visiting some other some other place. Yes. Hey, you know, we've known each other for quite a while, and I know that your perspective and work has really been shaped from your own life experience. Could you take a few minutes and share your background and, and how that has shaped your perspective and insights? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I um, most people don't guess it when they when they look at me, but I'm I'm Swedish. I I grew up in Sweden. I grew up in a in a household where my my, my dad is Swedish. My mom, she was uh, American, black, and Cherokee. So it was. You have this mix of countries and cultures and race. And we grew up in a country, well, well, when I was young, was a very homogeneous country. Over time, it's gotten more, more diverse. Uh, but that really colored my experience. And I realized something quite significant, which was that I saw that whenever my parents were able to connect and combine um, different norms or ideas or pieces from the different backgrounds, new interesting things came out of it. This sort of planted a seed in my mind. And I carried that with me for basically for, uh, for the rest of my life. What was interesting though, was that when I went to college, I noticed a similar process happening when I was able to step into intersections of different disciplines, uh, you know, uh, geology and chemistry and, and, and mathematics and physics. And I could sort of see that again, if we were able to combine ideas, you could come up with something new. So both growing up in Sweden, kind of quite different from everybody else uh, on a cultural side. And then while I was getting myself sort of educated, I saw the similar process play out. And then I saw it happening when I had a couple of startups. And that was really what formulated a life philosophy, which was that diversity and inclusion drives innovation. And every day I think back to what happened when I grew up as part of the narrative of what happens with, with all of our customers today and as part of the narrative of the thought leadership that I've created. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you for, for sharing that. Just, uh, yeah, fascinating, fascinating background, fascinating experience. And I know that that has really shaped your work. Can you talk, talk a little bit about how, how your background has shaped your work? Yeah, so um, this idea, this idea that diversity and your ability to tap into different perspectives, that was key to driving innovative ideas uh, and to driving uh, creative ideas. That ultimately became something that I honed in on. And, and, and I, I wrote a book called The Medici Effect that came out many years ago, uh, but it became a transformative book. Uh, and uh, Harvard Business School Press actually re-released it a couple of years ago because it's even more relevant today than it did back then. Today, what we're seeing is increasing needs for innovation everywhere, increasing needs for agility everywhere. Uh, but there wasn't as clear of an understanding of how diversity and inclusion drives that innovation, how we can actually make that happen. And that was what I was articulating in my, in my research and the science that I developed. And so when enough questions came from companies to get help on how to do this, uh, we really started setting up a way of codifying these set of ideas and helping companies all over the world to understand how do you take, how do you take a team and how do you make that team high performing? How do you make it more innovative? How do you make it more, more agile? How do you make it, how do you, how do you drive revenue? How do you cut costs? Whatever this team needs to do. And how do you do it from the basis of understanding how to use diversity and inclusion? And you know, what was interesting about that was that this was a, it seemed like a, any team in an organization, this was relevant. We had teams like saying the supply chain that was trying to understand how does inclusion and diversity matter for me? You know, uh, they couldn't really make the connect as opposed to say more of a 
consumer-facing team. But, but here we're able to sort of bring that to bear. And, 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 and we noticed two things. One was that there needed to be an understanding of how you relate between expertise and experience with diversity, and also that you have an understanding of what the difference between diversity and inclusion is. And so we created this framework. And Greg, I don't, I, we talked about this before. I'd love to be able to show this framework for all the people that are, that are watching today um, on how this actually plays out. What, what, what do you say about that? Let's do it. Let's do it. I know you normally do this on a much bigger, bigger stage, but we'll, we'll see how that translates onto the smaller stage. Would, it would be a gift for you to share that with, uh, with our audience. Thank you. Okay, fantastic. So we see this on the screen here. Imagine that you um, have a team and you could choose of adding a new person to this team. And you have a choice. You have a choice between a person named Peter and this person named Luis. And if you, if you look at that screen carefully, you can see that the bubble around this person, the surface area of this person is different. Peter's surface area and bubble is bigger. And that bubble represents this person's sort of sum total experience and expertise. Now, if you knew nothing else, you'd say, well, I'd probably pick Peter because Peter's bubble is bigger. But what we were saying was that, well, actually you don't have enough information yet to make that call. You need to know what type of team this person joins. And in this case, the person joins this team. You got George, you got Juan, you got Maria. Maria is super experienced. As you can see, her bubble doesn't even fit the screen that I put up there. You got Gita, you got Bill. And if you were to sort of map this out on a, on a classic sort of two by two, if you will, you can kind of come out like this. Here's George and, and Maria and Juan and, and Gita. And here's Bill. And here's Peter. And here's Luis. Now, who, add more, who adds more to this team? And it's Luis, it's Luis. And what's interesting is that if you ask the group to the left, my bet is that what that group would have said is that the size of the box that we're operating in is this. We're, we're pretty good at what we're doing. We might be the best in the world at what we're doing. And so it actually requires a Luis to understand that it's even possible to expand the box. And we've seen this play out over and over and over again. We have data from over 4,000 teams around the world. I'm going to give you two very quick examples of how this plays out and why this sort of way of thinking about diversity and how it relates to experience and expertise is extremely important. So we have this hospital in, uh, in the UK, in Cambridge, and uh, they have to, they're looking for ways to improve their ability to coordinate and collaborate in order to drop error rates and drop flaws, which has impacts on, on, on fatality rates. Uh, now, the obvious thing to do that would be to say, well, well, how are the hospitals solve this problem? <clears throat> but the surgical team here didn't do that. What the surgical team did was they, they teamed up with a pit stop crew for, for a Formula One car racing team to try to understand how are they coordinating? How are they collaborating? Are there things that we can learn from them? And indeed there are. And once you realize that there are elements from a completely different industry that they could borrow and, and, and combine, they were able to drop the error rates at, this, at these surgical units. And so now the pit stop model is one that is spread through hospitals around the world. And another example across cultures, Ahida Sinetti, traditional Muslim woman, moves from Lebanon to Australia, to, you know, and, and she realized that the average dress code for Australian beach culture is quite different from the dress code for a traditional Muslim woman. And but she asked herself, well, what happens if I combine these things? And that's what she did. She combined the notion of a bikini with a burqa or a hijab, and she creates the burkini, which basically enables millions of women to now engage in sports that they couldn't have done before. And a couple of years ago, Nike created an entire sort of product line called the Pro Hijab line around this. And so here you can sort of see what happens. We're able to bring in a perspective that is different. That is the power of diversity. But I'm only really giving you so I have the story of this, because if you don't have inclusion, that diversity doesn't really matter. You need inclusion to make diversity actually matter. In fact, my, what we see is that inclusion is quite common on teams that are homogeneous. Inclusion there is less of an issue. But in diverse teams, something happens. And I think it is important that we, in this context, go back to this image again. I want us to take a look at this and really try to understand what is actually happening in this process. Because there's at least two forces acting on this team. 
So the first one is this group to the left. See, this group to the left can look at Louise. And they may even have invited Louise because she's different. But it's quite easy for this group to ignore her, intentionally or unintentionally. And what that really means is that effectively, it is as if Louise is not really part of this team. And indeed, she might leave. But either way, you're back to this set of thoughts. Now, there's also something else going on in this scenario. And in some ways, it's even more powerful. Um, what is really happening here is that Louise can spot that this is what is happening. And so what does she do in response? How does she react to the fact that this group is doing this? Well, step by step, Louise starts to leave behind those things that make her different. She leaves them home. She certainly doesn't bring them to work. And again, it is as if Louise disappears, but this time not completely. There's another Louise now that emerges, but this Louise is different. She's just a fraction, really, of her um, self, of her total self. But either way, the size of the box is dropping out. This, these forces are exceptionally powerful. They explain to us both how inclusion and belonging relates to diversity. It explains to us why psychological safety is so important. Because you want the Louises on your team. And in fact, we've all been a Louise at some point in our life. Although some people are Louises far more often than others. Every time I show this to leaders or managers or audiences anywhere, it gets an immediate response. Because they understand both what it means to have been Louise, but also what it means to this group to the left. And if you really want to drive innovation, you're going to have to resolve it. Now, there are a lot of different things that you can do in this case. We call them moves on our platform, and they are critical. But I'm going to show you one that probably matters more than any other move, and it is this one. Adding somebody else to this team that is different, maybe not in the same way that Luis is different, just different, means that two things happen. This group to the left will have a harder time ignoring both Luis and Jenny, in this case. And Louise and Jenny will have an easier time staying true to who they are. And that sort of creates this model. And I believe it's turned out to be extremely powerful to explain the dynamics of a team. And we've invested over a decade to understand how to actually make, make this very specific situation play out to the best of a team's ability. So I, I have to tell you, my friend, I have seen you present that many times, and we've had this discussion. You, 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 you've been kind enough to join us at Workday and share this presentation as part of our Vibe Week, which I know we'll talk a little bit about later. So powerful every time. That, the imagery that you have there, the power, and, that, and, 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 and just so grateful for teeing up this idea that we want to look at it both ends. We want to see what are the broad reasons that this, these things are happening, and thank you for being so practical. Here's the one thing that perhaps matters more than others. And that has stuck with me for years since you presented that. Thank you. Uh, and, I, and I do think, I do think this, a model is important, but only if it's simple enough to understand what it means. But what starts happening is that people try to identify, who am I? Am I, am I on the left? Am I Louise? Am I a Bill who, who sort of can help translate? I mean, these things become, be, become touchstones for conversations. It enables teams yeah. to become high performing and convincing decisions that we care about this idea of inclusion and belonging and equity. So I'm gonna, you know, our, our goal here, we're gonna see it's a new tech platform for us. It's a it's a new day, but we're gonna invite you to uh, have your questions for friends on the platform. My colleagues, Liz Jenning is capturing your questions and will join us in a moment to, to share those. Liz, do we, do we have some questions yet? How are we? Welcome, by the way. Well, <laughs> hi Liz. <laughs> Hi, Greg. Hi, Franz. Always great to be here. Thank you so much for having me. We have had some audience interaction in the, uh, the Q&A here, so I can go ahead and fire these off if you're ready. Brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, let's run. Awesome. So, yeah, great. So, Franz, you know, in addition to being an expert, obviously, in this area, you're also a CEO yourself, and you probably spend a lot of time with other CEOs. 
What are you doing as a CEO or seeing from other CEOs to better nurture inclusion and belonging within their organizations? Right. It's a great, it's a great question. It's actually a particularly important question for, um, uh, for, for me because this is what we do. And so it, it, it sort of becomes incumbent of us to become, to be exceptional at this piece, right? Uh, and, and right now we are going through a, a very high growth uh, phase of, of, our, of our company since we sort of unleashed our virtual platform, which has exploded during, during this era of, of, uh, of COVID. So it becomes even more important. You, you got to get culture, right? And that culture has to be able to scale. So what is it that, what is it that we do uh, besides sort of generally saying that we try to live up to all the tenets of the, uh, of the, of the Medici effect, they really boil down to sort of a few key things. Uh, it's the ability for teams to understand how to use inclusion and belonging and diversity to drive business outcomes. This has always been the key because what we believe is that increasingly any team in any organization is increasingly pressured to, to, to drive performance, to drive outcomes. So the, so, so the first thing is that anybody who joins us needs to understand that that is the frame. It's, it, it is, this matters because you're in a company and this company is looking to make a difference in the world. And what we need to understand is we may need to make that link between diversity, between inclusion, between equity and belonging. And we have to understand in granular detail how it drives this performance. Um, after that, it becomes a matter of values. I mean, we've been very fortunate in that in our, in our, in our, in our, well, and, and intentional, but in our interview process, the value of, of diversity and inclusion is critical. We people need to have experience and a and um, and and a desire to 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 seek out diversity and to want an inclusive environment, to call it out when it when it doesn't happen. It hurts me every time I hear it. Oh, well, there's there's something going on here and it doesn't feel like like it is it is creating the most inclusive environment somebody can say at our company. Well, what I like about though is that one, it gets called out and then the company is working hard to actually address that issue. And so it becomes a self-correcting mechanism. So those are some of the ideas that, uh, that, that place out for us. Awesome, Super thank helpful. you. Another Liz, yeah. Yeah, another question that came in. Uh, how do you understand power dynamics among best-in-class organizations building an inclusive environment? Um, that's a good question. Uh, to somebody who's gonna depend on, on the type of organization. Um, or, and increasingly, what I'm gonna say, I'm gonna do a caveat in saying that every organization seems to be trending in a similar direction. Well, what is that? A direction of constant change. So it's a direction of constant change. So here's what I, here's what I see as becoming increasingly important. It is increasingly important for leadership of an organization to be able to articulate vision and strategy and drive general alignment of that. Now, they may do that as a function of listening and, and understanding, sort of sense and responding to what the organization, what the organization itself is sensing. But this idea of having a vision and articulating it is important because secondarily, what the organization itself has to do is enable increasingly teams to go after this vision. And because you need to free up teams to be more innovative, to have more agency, it, this the, the articulation of the vision becomes important. So I believe that over time, the, it is more and more important for leaders to be able to articulate a vision so they're able to communicate for the rest of the company what we're, what we're doing so that everybody else can start innovating, experimenting, and executing towards that vision. And if the vision is alternating or changing, that itself needs to be communicated and aligned. So that's how I see this power dynamic, that much of the rest of the company is 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 exploring, looking for solutions. And to do that, it needs to tap into its diversity. It needs to be inclusive. And then the vision and the, and the direction is outlined uh, from top leadership. And I believe that that's not just the case for high growth companies. That's gonna be a case for virtually every single company, every single division is gonna have to start thinking this way. And that's why I see the link between the, the, the various levels of, a, of an entity. You know, and, and, and what's striking to me as you talk about that, 
is this idea of, and we're seeing it in the research throughout, we talked about it in Workday's conversations uh, 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 for a changing world recently, is also this focus on purpose, right? That sense of what is the organization's purpose? What's that compelling uh, vision and, and draw to people? And, you know, overwhelmingly, we're seeing that, that that has been amplified in the research. And let me, let me, actually, let me, let me add to that. When I talk about a vision, okay, uh, I, the, the purpose is baked into that, right? The, I, so, so um, uh, uh, is it a vision to say that we're going to double our sales? No, <laughs> it's a goal. Maybe it's a strategic goal, but it is a goal. The vision has to tap into purpose, and it has to get to something that uh, that 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 gets to uh, what it means to make a difference in the world. So. Uh, what one of the things that I hear from CEOs, I mean, it's it started a couple of years ago, and it just exploded over the past six to eight months. And that is when the CEO will ask me, when did my job go from just being sort of a, 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 an operator and a leader to becoming a politician? And what they're articulating when they're saying that is that now all of a sudden they as a leader have to take a stand on issues that they just thought that this company could stay completely out of. Well, that era is over. Uh, and the longer a leader is hesitating about what it means, the, 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 the more challenged it's going to be to be true to its purpose. And, and, and so here's the piece of advice I give these CEOs. It's, listen, maybe you miss... Maybe you maybe you missed the uh, uh, missed sort of what was happening this time around, but there's going to be more issues that are rising in sort of contemporary in, in the world that you expected to take a stand on, that you expected to to have a statement about. So why don't you do the following? Articulate to yourself what that stand is, so that you're prepared. You don't have to convene committees. And, 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 and have to have a lot of meetings about how should you, how should you reflect upon A, B, or C. Instead, you're kind of working that out right now. That way, that's just going to give your organization the ability to respond quickly when something happens. And that is what communicate. And you're able to do that if you're able to connect that to purpose. So, so just, just, uh, just yesterday at our company, we had, a, we had a, a meeting about what was happening in the country, in the United States, I should say, um, uh, right now in terms of the election and, and the capital and so on. And ultimately, my message was that everybody was on this call that we had internally know what to say because it's just going to align with our values. It's going to align with what we've always done. It's, it's pretty clear. And people know that. They knew it intuitively because they were hired for it. And they know it because we've been talking about it. Yeah, I'm going to invite Liz back to to, to add to, to also add one, but I, I just want to capstone that note. At least in the conversations we'll be having specifically around agility and enabling experience, some of the later sessions. For me, at least, this shift toward uh, a purpose and principles, and less so and away from sort of processes and policies. It is an underlying theme as we think about agility, right? And so anyway, we'll, we'll get more, much more into that, but I, I, I appreciate you planting that seed. Liz, do we have other questions from, from the group so I don't monopolize our conversation? <laughs> no, sounds great. Yes, we do actually. And a special thanks to Wagner for that really uh, great sparking question that we just uh, addressed. Our next question actually comes from Deirdre. And uh, she has a question for Franz as well. And she's asking, you know, you referenced the Medici model and um, that's a really great model. Are there other models as well that you found useful in fully immersing uh, inclusion and belonging as being part of secret sauces and embedding diversity strategies for increased business outcomes? Well, I think that there are a, a wide range of <clears throat> models that go to how we think about um, inclusion and belonging. Uh, around unconscious bias, et cetera. The, the, the reason why I developed this model and why, why I come back to this one, why, we, why we find it necessary to develop it is because um, it, most of the other models that we were working with, we find it challenging to connect it exactly to business outcomes and performance and innovation. And to us, that has always been the key. So, um, and so, um, uh, Effectively, that's really what that's really what we what we what we sort of have have really worked hard at developing and make happen. Um, 
and now the some of the names escape me on the on the on the uh, sort of unconscious bias. I think that those things are really helpful to understand the dynamic between, say, a Louise and and the team, or even the team itself. But ultimately, the ability to connect it back to business, the ability to connect it back to performance, the ability to connect it to innovation, is is going to be long term necessary, at least in our mind. Yeah. No thanks. Thanks much, Liz. Other. Other questions? Maybe yeah. have time for maybe one or two more before we'll wrap this up. Yep, I think we've got time for, for one last question again, uh, right directed towards you, Franz. You know, you've been working in this space for quite some time now. Uh, your book, The Medici Effect, was published about 15 years ago, and uh, our audience members curious, you know, how have things changed in this unique and different time? Wow, it's a great question. I, I, I got to tell you, you know, when The Medici Effect came out in 2004. Uh, people were talking about diversity and tolerance. For some of you that are, that are on this, you, you'll recognize that. And tolerance is a horrible word, but seemed like very progressive at the time. Like, we, I tolerate you. Uh, <laughs> so, so that has changed. And what's really, what's really happened is that the diversity word is still there, but we find more ways, more nuance to understand how to actually activate that diversity. And that's how I think about inclusion and belonging. Uh, this is really about activating that difference. You have difference, but how do you make use of it? And that's where those things are coming. So that's the first piece. The second one is that um, the, the, the interest, the, um, let me say the genuine interest at leadership has skyrocketed. Um, I think the events of last summer was contributing to that recently, but the trend has been clear over, over the years. And, and when, when I started talking about this in, in, in 2004, 2005, uh, many people were just kind of confused about the whole thing. It's like, is it, well, are you talking about innovation? Or are you talking about inclusion and diversity? Like, what are you talking about? Like, you have to pick one. I, I don't get that reaction anymore. Today, there is, it, it's clear to people's mind that these are connected. What they are struggling with is, what, would it, what does that mean for me? If I'm in a procurement team, a team in procurement, how do I, how do I think about inclusion, belonging, diversity. How do I think about that in equity? How do I think about that in helping drive my quarterly goals? And so, uh, and so we're sort of reaching this next era of this. I'm going to say one more thing about, about this as well, which, which is really coming, um, uh, which is new, but it's, it's, it, but it's still tied into these set of ideas. And that is that there's a, everything that is playing out right now for every single company that is on, on this call uh, they're going to have to relate to artificial intelligence, to AI. And what is, what is happening here is um, uh, that there is a, we've really put in motion a system where our approach to AI is in some ways, in, in sneaky ways, I should say, embedding, embedding our current biases. And, 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 and that is a problem. Uh, we see it individually how AI is sort of helping to filter the content that we interact with and, and narrowing our, our point of view. We also see it within teams, you know, and when, when organizations try to identify who a future successful employee is going to be, it sort of use, uses the data from what the past successful employee was. And, and that data is, is biased. And so what is important with the Medici effect today uh, is that it is actually, it's been a well-tested theory globally. It's, you know, it's, it's just, this this book has really impacted industry after industry all over the world. It's based on fundamentally on mathematics. And I'm not seeing how that is playing out to its benefit because through that one can create mathematical models, one can create a theory as to how a team should be behaving optimally. How does the team optimally use diversity? How does it use inclusion? And that is sort of a whole new era that we sort of need to bend with our, with our new company, Medicine X. Yeah, no, I'm uh, so grateful for you to uh, to to share that and, and and plant a seed actually for our our second session, which is going to be on digitalization, which uh, which will feature as one of our change makers there, your good friend Sam Palmaseno, the Bam. former uh, CEO of IBM. I know you spend quite a bit of time, and so Franz, I'm going to thank you for this incredible session. You plant that seed for our next session, and we're going to talk about the importance of. Uh, of a bias and machine learning during our digitalization section, because that's that's obviously, as you've talked about, something that's really important. You know, on behalf of our CHRO Changemaker community and my Workday colleagues, I can't thank you enough for your inspiring leadership 
and for sharing your perspectives today. Every time we have a chance to uh, to speak, I, I I learn so much. Thank you, Greg. This was fantastic, and thank you, Liz. Uh, this was some great questions as well. So thanks to the whole community and uh, and Ashley and Neil as well. Look forward to talking. Well, stay to you well, soon. my friend. We will talk. We'll talk soon. Absolutely.